Hello. Um, recording another video today. It's been a while since I uh, recorded one. And I just wanted to summarize this month's um, Come Follow Me uh, lesson study topic, topics because I think there's a, a lot of important things in here that uh, some people may gloss over. So uh, I'm not going to be reviewing um, you know, more of the standard things that you know, everybody understands, uh, but uh, I'm going to spend some time uh, talking on uh, about some points that if you've missed them in your personal study, just to give you an opportunity to uh, ponder about them. So I'm going to start out just talking about um, in the beginning uh, with the book of Numbers. And if you go to the very first chapter of Numbers, um, we start reading about the children of Israel and they're being um, counted. Thus, you know, the name of the chapter Numbers. But um, there's some more details that I want to make sure that we understand here. And I'm, I'm reading from the second verse of Numbers chapter 1. Take ye the sum of all the congregation of the children of Israel after their families by the house of their fathers with the number of their names, every male by their pole from 20 years old and upward, all that are able to go forth to war in Israel. So the reason for this census is basically to create the armies of Israel. And it's not, we're not counting all everybody in a household. We're only counting those that are of an age that they could take up arms uh, for the founding uh, country of Israel. And that's between 20 and let's, you know, say some upward band of probably around 60 years old, where we're not given the upper band, only the lower band of 20 years old. So, um, we go through and we count all of those um, men. And later on in the chapter, I think this gets us to verse 46, we get the total number, which is, even all that were numbered were 600,000 and 3,000 and 550. So this is a lot of people, particularly when you're talking about, you know, a band in the population, you know, males are 50% of the population, for instance. But when you take a band of 20 to say 60 years old band, well, if you take the same band of people from, you know, our demographics, that represents about 26% of the population would fall into this group. Um, so if you have numbers like 600,000 um, representing 26% of the population, you're looking at about 2.3 million Israelites. Now, some Bible scholars say this is impossible. There's no way that um, Israel could have grown this much. I mean, you'll remember Israel, you know, the prophecy was that Israel was going to be in Egypt for 400 years. Now, you know, there's some debate as to when the beginning of that 400 years was. But we know that when Jacob and his family came to Egypt, they numbered 70 people, according to the you know, book of Genesis. So we're moving over the space of, let's say, of 400 years, 70 people to 2.3 million people. It's a staggering growth rate. Um, if you read in uh, the first chapter of Exodus, we read this. And the children of Israel were fruitful and increased abundantly and multiplied and waxed exceedingly mighty. And the land was filled with them. Now there arose a new king over Egypt who knew not Joseph. And he said unto his people, Behold, the people of the children of Israel are more and mightier than we. So incredibly, this Pharaoh is acknowledging the fact or verifying the fact that over the course of time, the children of Israel have grown more numerous than all the inhabitants of Egypt. Now, 
in the scriptures, when we talk about things being multiplied, it's synonymous with the blessings of the Lord. For example, Jacob's, um, when he was serving his uh, father-in-law uh, for 14 years, one of the things um, that the people knew that uh, Jacob was special was because his flocks multiplied so exceedingly. Um, Joseph of Egypt, you know, things under his uh, watchful care multiplied uh, exceedingly. That's how people knew that Joseph was special. So now we're seeing this whole nation of Israel being multiplied exceedingly, um, which shows that the Lord is prospering this country. Now, they didn't feel like they were under prosperous circumstances, right? They were in bondage uh, in Egypt. Uh, nevertheless, if you take that growth rate, 2.3 million, and you divide it by the initial 70 souls, I mean, that's a growth rate. Uh, they grew 33,000 times um, over that period of time. Now, Israel, they're the Lord's people, so it makes sense that the Lord would prosper them. But I wanted to take this period of time, 400 years, and look in just what had hap what's happened to the world in general, to kind of put this in context um, over the last 400 years for us. So 400 years um, ago, the world um, had 580 million people in it. And as yeah, so of the 2020 census um, and estimates, you know, where uh, the estimate is that there are about 7.9 billion uh, people. So uh, if you divide that out over that 400 year period of time, you get, you know, 13.6 um, times. Now, if you look at China over that same period of time, their growth rate is less than that. Um, but if you look at the United States over that period of time, the United States was founded, really, you get your first permanent settlements uh, with the Pilgrims on the Mayflower in 1620. And there was a 1620 census and counted about um, a thousand Europeans in America in 1620. Fast forward 400 years, the 2020 census put 330 million um, Americans on this uh, country. That is a growth rate of 330,000 times. So if you look at England at that same time, England in 1620 had around um, 4 million people. And in 2020, they had just under 70 million people. So um, the United States, our population grew five times greater by the end of the 400 year period of time than the mother country of England. So that shows the scriptures talk about America being a land of promise um, and specifically that it will be a land of promise for Joseph, um, which, you know, is the birthright son of Israel. So when you look at that, you look at Israel and their tremendous growth rate, and you look at the United States of America and its tremendous growth rate, these two nations stand head and shoulders above all other nations um, that you know, I've you know, looked at. I mean, there's no one remotely uh, close to this. I think China's growth rate over this time was nine something. Um, I think uh, England's growth rate over this period of time was like 16.4. Uh, million. So when you're talking 33,000 and 330,000, I mean, it, you're talking the Lord is magnifying um, the nation of Israel anciently, just as the Lord has magnified the United States and made it, you know, the most powerful country in the world. Uh, now, there's a reason for that. Now, as, as we get further um, into this chapter, we'll, we're going to talk about it more, for, you know, for instance, I mean, if you number these 600,000 male soldiers in Israel, um, you divide that by 12, I mean, 
50 times 50,000 times 12 is 600,000. So you've got an average of 50,000 in every tribe. However, there are two of the 12 tribes of Israel that have almost 50% more than the other 10 tribes. And that is Judah and Joseph. And to me, that is really interesting because Judah would go on to be the nation of Judah and Joseph would go on to um, be the capital of the nation of Israel. And today, the only two countries that um, were founded as promised lands um, and their very founding is based upon the providence of the God of Israel is the nation of Israel and the United States of America. Uh, the nation of Israel over in Jerusalem is clearly associated with Judah. Now, the nation of the United States of America, according to the Book of Mormon, is clearly associated with Joseph. But I want to highlight uh, something that I just find fascinating. And I don't know if they'll still have this handout uh, if you go to Federal Hall. Originally, they didn't have a Bible present in the room that George Washington was being sworn in. And he felt very strongly that he needed to put his hand upon the Bible as he was sworn into this country because he felt that this country um, was founded by divine providence. And so, you know, someone quickly went out and brought a Bible back in and they opened the Bible at random to the page that you see um, on the screen. Now, I have highlighted in yellow um, some particular passages which uh, Joseph or uh, George Washington's hands would have been placed upon. Now, the, to me, this is astounding and it's a fulfillment of prophecy. Let me uh, read you what these uh, verses um, say and you can tell me if you think um, that the, this is uh, prophetic or not. So uh, the, the passage highlighted in yellow starts out as follows. Joseph is a fruitful bough, even a fruitful bough by a, a well, whose branches run over the wall. The archers have short, sorely grieved him and shot at him and hated him. Now think about this. This is the conclusion of the Revolutionary War, when the most powerful nation on the earth was going to war against the 13 original colonies in America. And you know, they hated you know, the fact that these patriots were trying to break apart from the king and form their uh, own nation, the uh, audacity of them. So they went to war. And um, then the next uh, verse says, but Joseph's bow abode in strength and the arms of his hands were made strong by the hands of the mighty God of Jacob. You know, if this isn't a fulfillment of prophecy with the miraculous victory of the Revolutionary War, wherein George Washington lost almost every single battle he ever fought, except for the last couple ones, which, you know, were all that mattered. Um, the God of Israel strengthened his hand. And then it says this, uh, From thence is the shepherd the stone of Israel, meaning that from this country would come forth the shepherd and the stone of Israel. Um, you remember that the term stone with relation to the church was first used when Christ changed um, Simon's name to Peter, meaning stone, and told him that uh, upon this rock, he would form his church, meaning that, you know, the Jews would take the gospel to the Gentiles um, and the, the church would be built up through the administration of the original um, 12 apostles. 
from Jerusalem. What this is talking about is once this nation is formed, then you will have the rock again and Joseph will go forth from this nation and be the shepherd that goes and gathers uh, Israel back into the fold. So um, th to me, this is just, you know, fascinating stuff. And, you know, to see, you know, the Lord's hand in this just by, you know, the sheer, you know, mathematics of this it is very significant and very profound to me and is, you know, something that I, you know, if, if you missed this when, when you were studying it, you know, I thought that you might want to uh, 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 ponder on that uh, for a little bit. Now, let's move on to the second chapter in Numbers. Um, I'm going to start with uh, verses, uh, verse 1 and 2. And the Lord spake unto Moses and unto Aaron, saying, Every man of the children of Israel shall pitch by his own standard with the ensign of their father's house. Far off about the tabernacle of the congregation shall they pitch. So what we're learning here is that, you know, Israel was divided into four camps. And these camps were placed all around the tabernacle of the congregation. We'll read a little bit more about this, but first I want to talk about what these standards are. Uh, are um, so Judah had I mean if you where this information comes from I mean you have the first five books of Moses um, which you know the Jews call the Torah and then you have the Talmud which is um, basically all the Jews oral traditions um, around the Torah or the first five books of Moses so um, when you go uh, and look at what the Jews um, said all of this stuff means, um, they talk about what these four standards were. And they say that the standard of Judah was the lion and that the standard of Joseph was an ox. Now, because we've been talking about Judah and Joseph and they have you know, particular significance um, given those are the only two populations of Israel, you know, there's two countries that I, you know, am claiming with a high degree of confidence are related to Israel, and that is the nation of Israel, Judah, and the United States of America, Joseph. Um, so if you read, you know, where Judah, you know, gets the lion from, Genesis 49. So... This, this comes from the, the same chapter that, um, you know, George Washington placed his uh, hand on, you know, remarkably enough. Judah is a lion's whelp. From the prey, my son, thou art gone up. He stood down. He couched as a lion and as an old lion who shall rouse him up. The scepter shall not part from Judah, nor a lawgiver from between his feet until Shiloh come. So... Judah is described as a lion. Um, the book of, of Revelation talks about Jesus Christ as the lion of Judah. Um, you know, the, the reasoning is clear. That was, you know, the standard of Judah was the lion. Um, but the fact that the scepter, meaning the governance of the house of Israel, would not depart from Judah until Shiloh come. That means until Christ comes. Um, and, you know, this is talking, you know, about, you know, when, when Christ came, um, Judah was a continuous people until that time. And then Christ came and, uh, Judah, uh, through, you know, their own stiff neckedness, uh, that Judah didn't think this is very interesting and very important for us to understand. Judah did not think that they were rebelling against the God of Israel when they rejected Jesus Christ. They were following the narrative that was, you know, being given to them by their leaders. Um, it just turns out that that narrative was being shaped by the father of lies. And, 
you know, so they thought that they were doing God's work by rejecting the Lord. And today, fast forward into, you know, life in the United States of America, and you can see that the author of the Jewish narrative is the author of the narrative that's going on in our day, where, I mean, right is wrong. The world has been turned upside down. And you have all of these moral warriors out there that, you know, are marching to the beat of, you know, the woke philosophies of the world. And they think that what they are doing is right. They think that they have a righteous cause. And, you know, in reality, you know, they once again are rejecting the God of Israel because they're listening um, to the wrong narrative. And I think it's imperative for us to make sure that the narrative that we are listening to is correct and that we don't get caught up in the philosophies of the world mingled with scripture that, you know, tell us these perversions that, you know, the only thing that matters is love um, and that anything done under the banner of love is, you know, good and right and acceptable and should be lauded. Uh, and that, you know, the only thing that is truly unacceptable is intolerance. Um, so, you know, even talking about these things gets people angry um, today. I, I bring them up just so that you understand that, you know, uh, we tend to point the finger at the Jews for how blind they were. But you look around at uh, our society today and we are every bit as blind. Um, and unless we're consciously going out and trying to obtain uh, our narrative from the Lord, you know, history will absolutely repeat itself. Um, so I talked about um, the standard of Judah being the lion. Uh, the standard of Ephraim was the ox. And you know, this comes from uh, Deuteronomy. So in Genesis 49, this is Jacob blessing the tribes of Israel. And in Deuteronomy, we have Moses blessing the tribes of Israel before they go into the promised land. So Deuteronomy 33, verses 16 through 17. For the precious things of the earth and the fullness thereof, for the goodwill of him that dwelt in the bush, let the blessings come upon the head of Joseph and upon the top of him that was separate from his brethren. So keep in mind, anytime the scriptures are talking about Joseph, or the blessings, these are prophetic blessings. You know, Joseph is a fruitful bough that runs over the wall. Joseph is separate from his brethren. Joseph crossed the ocean uh, and received a land of inheritance over here in the northern hemisphere. Um, that's, that's what it's talking about. Um, and then in verse 17, his glory is like the firstling of his bullock, and his horns are like the horns of unicorns. <laughs> now, you look at the, uh, um, the note there, and it says ox, okay? So his horns are like the horns of ox. With them he shall push the people together to the ends of the earth, and they are the thousands of Ephraim, and they are... Uh, they are the ten thousands of Ephraim, and they are the thousands of Manasseh. So again, reference to the shepherd um, of Israel that goes and herds Israel back together um, in the last days. When you go into the, the temple um, and to do baptisms for the dead, um, and I mean this comes right from the tabernacle of the congregation, it comes from the Solomon's temple, um, they had the baptismal font that was on the backs of 12 uh, oxen. And that was symbolic. The oxen were symbolic, obviously, of the 12 tribes of Israel. But each of those was, you know, that's the, the ox is Joseph. It's Joseph's standard. So it, the symbolism there is that Joseph would go out and gather Israel and on both sides of the veil. That's what that means. Um, so, you know, some cool uh, meaning behind these standards um, of, the, of the house of Israel. Now, uh, quickly, the, the standard of, of Dan was a flying eagle. 
and um, Dan was situated on the north of the tabernacle of the congregation. And then you have uh, the standard of Reuben, which was the silhouette of an Israelite. Um, now, a silhouette is, you know, it's just, you know, the profile um, of, a, of a, an Israelite. Um, <clears throat> now, these locations of the camps of Israel around the tabernacle of the congregation are significant because the tabernacle of the congregation itself is significant. I mean, you look at the tabernacle of the congregation, the crowning jewel was the Holy of Holies. And the Holy of Holies was holy because it contained the Ark of the Covenant, which is also known as the mercy seat, which is sim uh, a symbol for the throne of God. So the hosts of Israel are encamped about the throne of God. This is the symbol here. Now included in uh, the tabernacle of the congregation, you have these massive candles, seven candles. I mean, they weigh a talent of pure gold each. Um, that means that you know, there's about 75 pounds uh, each candlestick of pure gold. Um, and there's an altar uh, as well. And you know, there's symbolism of this elsewhere in the scriptures, but unless you understand, you know, this foundational understanding from the Old Testament, the rest of it's meaningless. But with this in mind, we can read chapters like um, the fourth chapter of uh, the book of Revelation, which begins with John the Revelator seeing the throne of God and God sitting upon that throne. And, you know, above the throne is a rainbow. And from the Old Testament, we know that the rainbow was the symbol that the Lord would not utterly destroy the earth um, at his second coming. It was a symbol that Zion would be reestablished upon the earth in the last days. And it's a general symbol of the covenants that God has made with his people. Um, so that's understanding all comes from the Old Testament. And then before the throne of God, you have in the same uh, chapter in Revelations 4, you have several, seven candlesticks, which is, you know, ties back to the tabernacle of the congregation uh, who had, you know, the seven candlesticks uh, before um, the Holy of Holies the, and the Ark of the Covenant, the mercy seat. Um, also in the book of Re Revelation, there's a, an altar uh, before the throne of God. And then you have four strange creatures, or they would be strange if you didn't know this foundational truth from you know, the very founding of Israel's history. Uh, and these four beasts are, there's you know, a lion, a beast that you know, it has you know, um, calves or oxen feet, but, an iron, but a, um, a lion's head. And then you have you know, one with an ox head and one with a, a flying eagle head. And then, um, you know, you have a man or an Israelite. Um, all four of these things are symbolic of the four standards of Israel. So the symbolism here clearly is the house of Israel before the throne of God. And uh, in that chapter, there everything is upon a sea of glass, which... You know, we learn from modern revelation is the earth in its exalted and celestialized state. Um, so it's a vision of what things will ultimately become. Um, and in that vision, uh, these four uh, creatures have wings and they have eyes all over their bodies. And we're told um, through modern revelation that that means that they have intelligence beyond normal people and the wings means that they can move in ways that normal uh, people cannot. So, you know, all of that can be understood from the context of, you know, what we're reading here in Numbers. Um, <clears throat> so I've, uh, I've talked about Joseph and Judah. Um, 
but I haven't talked to, uh, I, well, Judah was on the east of the tabernacle, and Joseph was on the west of the tabernacle. And I think that's very interesting because, um, again, Judah and Joseph are the only two um, bodies of Israel that have corresponding nations with them, uh, related to them, and were founded in promised lands uh, upon the earth today. And um, Judah is in the east and Joseph is in the west. Now you've got Dan and Reuben in the north and south. Now <clears throat> the north is clearly in the scriptures related to the origin from uh, whence the 10 tribes will return in the last days. Now, also from the book of Revelations in Revelation chapter 12, you have an Israelite, and we know that she is an Israelite because she gives birth to the Son of God, uh, who's from the tribe of Judah. Um, so we have this woman who is an Israelite, um, and she she's a combination of the standard of the other two uh, groups of Israel. Um, she is an Israelite, so that's the standard of Reuben. But then she's given wings of a great eagle, the standard of Dan, with which she flees from uh, before the face of the dragon until time and times and the dividing of time. So uh, then the remnant of Israel is left with the dragon. By this we're to understand the earth. Um, Satan is bound here upon the earth. And these 10 tribes or the, you know, um, of Israel were removed and basically Joseph and Judah uh, remain and have been buffeted and um, harassed and destroyed by Satan ever since. Um, that's a fascinating chapter if you're not familiar with it again, it's Revelation chapter 12. But that all stems from, you know, this basic understanding that we get from numbers. <clears throat> now, um, I'd like to uh, move forward here um, to numbers. I mean, we, t we talk a lot about, you know, in numbers, um, things about the tabernacle of the congregation and just kind of the organization of things like this. In Numbers chapter 6, you've got the covenant of the Nazarene, which is pretty interesting. But, you know, we get over to Numbers chapter 13. And then this gets, this gets really interesting um, to me. So Moses has finally brought the children of Israel to Canaan. Um, and he sends 12 spies into the land, land of Canaan. And they're to kind of search out the land the length and the breadth of it, and come back and give the people a report. But these people are not chosen at random. In number th Numbers 13, verse 12, it says, Send thou men that they may search the land of Canaan, which I give unto the children of Israel. Of every tribe of their fathers shall ye send a man, every one a ruler amongst them. So you've got the ruler of each of the 12 tribes, being the scouts that you know, go into Canaan. So this is symbolic, okay? The rulers represent, you know, the people. Um, these aren't rulers by birthright, right? I mean, these are rulers by the voice of the people. So, you know, they represent the people that selected them to be their rulers. So they go out and spend 40 days going through um, Israel. And, or, well, you know, what would become Israel? You know, it's Canaan at the time. And, you know, they come back and uh, they give a report to the children of Israel. And, you know, they say, sure enough, this place is flowing with milk and honey. Um, and, you know, they bring this cluster of grapes that's so big that, it's on a pole between two Israelites just to carry this thing. Um, and they lay it down on their feet and they say this um, from verse 32. 
they brought up an evil report of the land which they had searched unto the children of Israel, saying, The land through which we have gone to search it is a land that eateth up the inhabitants thereof, and all the people that we saw in it are men of great stature. Now, all is a very large percentage. They're saying, these people are not like us. They're huge. Goes on in 33. And there we saw the giants, the sons of Anak, which come of the giants. And we were in our own sight as grasshoppers. And so we were in their sight. So there's something really weird about the inhabitants of Canaan. Um, I mean, they are people of enormous stature. Uh, Goliath of Gaul was, you know, one of these original Canaanites that wasn't killed um, in the Great Purge. And, you know, I mean, he was going on, um, you know, 10 feet tall. Um, uh, King Og of Basham was 14 feet tall. Um, so you have, I mean, you, you go to Amos, I think it's Amos chapter 2, verse 9. Um, it, the Lord is talking about how the Amorites um, or the people of the land of Canaan were the height of cedar trees and as strong as oak trees, and yet he destroyed them. So you know, the point here is the, these people, these rulers in Israel, they come back after they have seen what the Lord has done in Egypt, uh, how the Lord destroyed the most powerful army on earth uh, by miraculous means, they say, it's over. We cannot win against these giants. There's no way. And they start weeping and wailing and mourning. And Moses and Aaron and Joshua and Caleb, which quickly, I mean, if, if you're not aware of this, you need to be aware. Um, Let's just look at what tribe Caleb came from. So this is in Numbers 13, verse 6. Of the tribe of Judah, Caleb, the son of Judah. <clears throat> and then of the tribe of Ephraim, Oshea, the son of Nun. And then down in verse 16, these are the names of the men which Moses sent to spy out the land. And Moses called Oshea, the son of Nun, Joshua. So Caleb is from Judah and Joshua is from Joseph. So these, it was only Judah and Joseph that didn't rebel. The other 10 leaders of Israel totally had no faith that the Lord could deliver them from the hands of the giants. And, you know, so Joshua and Caleb and Moses and Aaron, they they rip their clothes and they're trying to convince the people that you know, the Lord can do anything. I mean, he's not like us. He's a supernatural being. Uh, there is literally nothing that he cannot do. And the people are so scared that, you know, their followers might listen that, um, and go to war against the giants that they pick up stones and they're about to kill Moses, Aaron, uh, Joshua, and Caleb. And the Lord intervenes. Um, and then the Lord tells uh, Moses, listen, you know, I'm done with, you know, Israel, referring to the 10 tribes, not Judah and Joseph. But, you know, I'm done with those guys. Um, you know, he specifically, you know, he says this. And the Lord said unto Moses, how long will this people provoke me? And how long will it be ere they believe me for all the signs which I have showed them? I will smite them with pestilence and disinherit them and will make of thee, Moses, a greater nation and mightier than they. So this is phenomenal to me. And you'll, you'll see why in a little bit, but let's just talk about this. So basically the Lord is saying, listen, these 10 tribes, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to wipe them out. You know, they're, they're supposed to be my people. But a people that will not follow me, it's not a people at all. You know, I'm going to 
get rid of them, and I will raise up a nation from you, Moses, that will be mightier than they are. That's a profound thing. And you'll see that I don't, I believe that the Lord made good on this. And, and you'll, you'll see why in a second. So Moses goes to the Lord and he, you know, beseeches him. Uh, in uh, verses 19, uh, he says, Pardon, I beseech thee, the iniquity of these people according to the greatness of thy mercy. In other words, pardon the iniquity of the ten tribes. Um, as thou hast forgiven this people from Egypt even until now. And the Lord said, I have pardoned according to thy word. So, in other words, the Lord says, okay, I'm not going to destroy them yet. Uh, but then in verse 21, he says something I think is incredible. But as truly as I live, all the earth shall be filled with the glory of the Lord. So what this means, I mean, the when Moses is talking to his people in Deuteronomy, he, he tells them, listen, um, before the foundations of the earth, when the Lord was designing everything, the borders of nations, he did it all with Israel in mind. Because Israel is the inheritance of the Lord. And so when the Lord is saying, as I live, the earth will be filled with my glory. He's talking about Israel filling the earth with glory. So ask yourself, has this ever happened before? In the history of the earth, has Israel ever filled it with glory? And the answer is absolutely not. This is something that we look forward to in the future. Now, I'll call to mind, um, again, the 10th article of faith, which begins, we believe in the literal gathering of Israel, which is happening. This is one of the main missions of Joseph, right? You know, Joseph is an ox, the shepherd, uh, which is you know going through and gathering in Israel with its horns from the ends of the earth. Um, that's what Joseph has been doing since the restoration of the church. <clears throat> the second part of that is, we believe in that. So we believe in the literal gathering of Israel and in the restoration of the lost 10 tribes. So there is a restoration. Now, think of this in the context of what the Lord told Moses. He said, Moses, I'm done with these guys. I'm going to raise up a nation from you that will be mightier than they. I think the Lord did that. <clears throat> um, the 10 tribes were ultimately wiped out, except for Joseph. Um, Joseph, you know, was dispersed, uh, but the 10 tribes as a body was taken off into Assyria in 720 BC. And, um, in the Apocrypha, in the book of Second Esdras, it says that while they were in captivity, they came to themselves and they said, listen, we have never kept the covenants of the Lord. Let's go to the Lord. And let's renew this covenant with him. And perhaps he will lead us uh, to another land. And then the Lord says, showed forth signs and stopped the river Euphrates, just like you know, the Jordan River was stopped, which you know, we'll talk about in a little bit. And then they went uh, north um, to a, a great uh, distance to a land called, um, what was it, Ars Arsereth, something like that, where uh, never before man had dwelt. Um, now, remember, in 34 AD, Jesus Christ went and visited these people in a body. Um, remember the 12th or uh, Revelation chapter 12, the woman who was given wings of an eagle and, you know, taken into the wilderness. I think that's the 10 tribes uh, of Israel. They were, they were removed. And, you know, I think that the Lord has made of them a mighty people. Um, in fact, there's some scriptures that are worth, uh, you know, reading. One of them comes from Jeremiah. Um, this is Jeremiah 31. Uh, verse 2, and 
you know, uh, I'll put it up on the screen, but you know, the, the gist of it is that, you know, the Lord's people who you know, were taken to the wilderness find grace in the wilderness. Um, in other words, they finally get it when they're in the wilderness. Now, it's, you know, the, this, it's the 10 tribes that went into the wilderness. Now, in Ezekiel, Ezekiel chapter 20, uh, it talks about, you know, the portion of Israel that was in the wilderness and that the Lord would come uh, to them in the wilderness um, of the people and that he would speak to them face to face. Uh, that's exactly what the Lord told the Nephites he was going to do um, in 3 Nephi chapter 17, verse 4, or around there. Um, he said, hey, you know, I, I'm going to go, you know, minister to the lost tribes of Israel, for they are not lost unto their father, for he knoweth whither he hath taken them. So the Lord took these people somewhere. And he took them somewhere that's beyond the influence of Satan, uh, where they are prospering and thriving in the wilderness. Now, you think about how much Israel grew in 400 years, okay? Um, from 70 to some 2.3 million, this body of Israel, the 10 tribes that was taken away north, it comprised of at least 5,000 households because um, you know, that's what you know, the scriptures say, that at that time there were 5,000 um, men that had not bowed the knee to Baal. Um, and I think that you know, if the Lord was going to preserve a remnant of Jacob, it would have been from those that were faithful amongst the masses. So if you start out with 5,000 instead of 70, and then uh, you have 2,700 years in the wilderness uh, where you're blessed by the Lord, um, then the scriptures that talk about the restoration of Israel in the last days rivaling the exodus of Egypt in you know wonder and might, and nations of um, Israelites being birthed in a single day, um, and the lands of inheritance of Israel being overrun in a single day began to make a lot more sense. Um, so when the Lord said to Moses, listen, as I live, the earth will be filled with my glory. Um, I think that the restoration of the house of Israel has a tremendous role to play um, in that. And it's much more meaningful when you understand um, the history of Israel. Now, um, so the, the Lord doesn't destroy the 10 tribes at that time, um, but nor, do, nor do, uh, do any of the Israelites uh, inhabit the lands of Canaan. They're... Um, destined to wander in the wilderness of Sinai for 40 years, uh, one year for every day that the 12 scouts were in Israel, until, you know, all of the um, men die off. And, you know, keep in mind that the numbers of these men were, you know, 20 to probably 60. So after 40 years, your young men, they're now 60. And, you know, everyone that was 60, they're all gone. Um, except for Caleb and Joshua, who are now both 80 years old, but the Lord preserved them, and it, it said that their strength was the same as it was 40 years earlier. And you know, they come back, and you know Moses takes the people uh, with Caleb and Joshua um, to... Um, what is it, Moab, and he makes, he renews the covenant with them again, and he reminds them, listen, now you're about to go into the lands of Canaan, and Moses, by the way, you're not going to go. Um, I've got different plans for you. Um, and then Moses, 
you know, just kind of lays down the covenants again. And he reminds them in Deuteronomy chapter 30, um, what will happen to them if they break the covenants. And interestingly enough, in Deuteronomy um, verse 4, it talks about, you know, in the last days when, you know, these people get it and, you know, the time has come for them to be restored, that a portion of them will be restored from the outermost parts of heaven. Uh, so I find that interesting. But Moses, interesting, but Moses himself is not permitted uh, to go into um, the lands of Canaan. Uh, he is instead uh, taken up uh, by the hand of the Lord. Um, he's translated, in other words. <clears throat> and uh, you, can, you can read about that in Deuteronomy uh, 34, uh, verses 5 through 6. And you've got to look at the uh, footnote C on verse 6. Um, because, I mean, those, those verses say, yeah, uh, Moses died and he was buried, but nobody knows uh, where he was buried because the Lord did it. Um, and you know, then you look at that footnote uh, in 6C and it says, C translated beans. Now, the people of the Book of Mormon, you know, their version of the uh, five books of Moses seems to have been more complete um, because... Um, the Book of Mormon in Alma uh, 45, 19, um, they talk about Alma, what happened to Alma, and how you know nobody knew where Alma died or where he was buried. And they say, you know, we think that the same thing happened to Alma as happened to Moses. Uh, that is to say that the Lord took them. They were translated. Now, when you're talking about translated beings, particularly in the context of what we've been reading about so far, um, Joseph Smith taught that, you know, the reason that the Lord translates, you know, people in the first place isn't so that they are brought up into his presence, but rather to enable them to be ministers to people in other worlds. Um, and, you know, that's out of, uh, you know, right out of church history. I'll, I'll throw that quote on the... Uh, on the screen for you. But in light of Moses being translated and him telling them that there were going to be a portion of the house of Israel that would be gathered in from the ends of heaven, that is to say from other worlds, um, the fact that Moses is translated so that he could minister to other worlds and the, lo the Lord specifically tells Moses, listen, um, I will make of thee a greater nation and mightier than they. Um, I think that Moses has probably had a pretty significant role to play amongst the 10 tribes of Israel. Um, of course, this is the gospel according to Michael Rush, but you know, the Lord doesn't just do these things willy nilly, which means, you know, Elijah probably has an incredible role uh, amongst, um, you know, the 10 tribes of Israel. Alma, who was translated, was probably translated because he has an incredible role to play amongst the children of Israel, the last 10 tribes. And, you know, the day is going to come when we will have the records of the last 10 tribes. Right now, we've got the stick of Judah and we've got the stick of um, Ephraim. But the day will come when we have the history of all the last 10 tribes. And, you know, it will be spectacular to understand you know, what the role of these men uh, was in their history. So, uh, you know, now the Lord translates Moses, and um, now he says to Joshua, listen, Joshua, I'm going to be with you just like I was with Moses. And, you know, now we're, we're in Joshua, you know, chapter one, right? And in... In Joshua 1, multiple times in the chapter, the Lord tells Joshua that he will magnify him in the sight of Israel, but that he needs to have courage. Um, and, you know, that's, you know, very important because he's about to go to war against the giants. And... 40 years before this, 
you know, Israel melted down at the prospect of this. So the Lord tells, you know, um, uh, Joshua, listen, I'm going to be with you. I'm going to show Israel that I'm with you, but you need to be courageous. Um, and so Joshua is courageous. Now he's 80 years old. And the first thing that they do is Joshua selects 12 men, one from every tribe, and says, listen, I want you to go get the Ark of the Covenant, and I want you to go and cross the River Jordan. And as soon as you step in the River Jordan, the Lord's going to divide the river, just like he divided the Red Sea. And all Israel is going to see this. And that's exactly what happened. And the river dried up on you know, the one side and piled up high. It just kept getting bigger and bigger and bigger. Now, you, you know, you're, you're talking about hundreds of thousands of, you know, gallons of water, you know, probably, you know, a second in the Jordan River um, that are just piling up uh, upon themselves. And you've got 2.3 million people that need to cross this river. That takes a long time. It takes all day. By the, by the end of this, I mean, you've got a wall of water on one side of this river that is shocking. And in fact, the inhabitants of the land on the other side are watching this. And, you know, the scriptures say that their hearts melt with fear because of this. And they know that the Lord's people are coming. Now, you know, these people had been warned. Uh, we don't have all of the records about this, but um, Sodom and Gomorrah were Canaanite cities and they were destroyed. Um, you know, certainly, you know, there were uh, prophets that were warning them and prophesying to them. Melchizedek and his people were in the land of Canaan. Uh, we don't know, but that they were Canaanites as well. Um, and they surely prophesied to these people about what was going to happen to them if, you know, they continued in their wicked ways. And, you know, one of the reasons that the Lord told Abraham for why Abraham needed to go to Egypt was because the Canaanites hadn't become fully ripened yet. Um, so now here we are 400 years later and they are fully ripened. And so they cross through on the other side and Joshua sends spies into Jericho, which is the first city that they come to, uh, which has massive walls. I mean, the people are very powerful uh, there. Um, and so meanwhile, Joshua gets up early in the morning and he walk, he's walking and he sees a man over by the wall of Jericho. And the man is holding a drawn sword. So Joshua is curious. He knows that the Lord's with him, so he doesn't, doesn't fear a man with a sword. And he, he goes up to this man and says, listen, are you with Israel? Or are you against Israel? And the man says, I am the captain of the hosts of Israel. And Joshua immediately drops to his knees. And the man says, remove uh, the shoes from thy feet for the ground uh, whereupon uh, thou art is holy ground. Joshua was before Jehovah, who was holding a drawn sword and saying, listen, I'm the captain of the armies of Israel. Um, and I mean, this is you know, an awesome sight. Uh, again, in the book of Revelation, you have similar imagery where you have the Lord um, coming to the earth in the last days and the armies which were in heaven I think this is in Revelations 19, are behind him. And he just annihilates the enemies of the Jews. And he, he utters a curse that destroyed the, the remaining wicked throughout the entire earth. And, you know, I mean, the, the curse is, is terrible, but not a single wicked person remains you know, at, that, at that time. But at this point, the Lord is going to destroy the Canaanites using Israel. Um, and so he, t he tells Joshua how this is all going to go down. And um, that's what Joshua does. But 
I want to jump back to the scouts that Joshua sent into Jericho. So they went and scouted around, and there's a woman who's a prostitute, uh, and her name's Rahab. And um, you know, most likely she was a you know a ritual prostitute because you know the Canaanites, um, you know, they worshipped, you know, many people who study this are very disturbed by the Canaanite religion because you know of how similar it is I mean to um, Judea Judeo-Christianity but it shouldn't be that surprising because it was just a perversion of it um, I mean you take Catholicism and the pantheon of saints that um, Catholics worship I mean you that is you know a, kind of a similar thing to Catholicism, Catholicism is, and I'm not trying to offend anybody here, but Catholicism is to the original Christian church what the Canaanites' religion was to the pure Judeo-Christian uh, um, religion as well. They worshipped a god named Elohim, um, and Elohim's son, whose name was Baal, which is just the untranslated form of the Lord. And... Baal was sacrificed um, and rose again on the third day. Uh, and they also worshipped um, Elohim's wife, the queen of heaven. Um, Elohim was the god of heaven, um, the king of heaven. So you have this religion that sounds very familiar to us, but the manner in which they carried out that religion was they said, listen, Elohim, and, you know, um, the queen of heaven, they have bodies of flesh and bone. Um, they're tangible. They have passions. And we should worship them with passions. And, you know, that's, that's what they did. Um, you know, they, they had Rahab. I mean, if she, were, if she uh, was a ritual prostitute, which that was very common um, in Canaan, then, um, you know, basically what that, that was is you were worshiping with your passions and the children um, that would come forth from these um, ritualistic um, sexual relations uh, were then sacrificed um, to Baal, just in the same, you know, after the manner that Elohim's son was sacrificed. And it was a, a total abomination. It was a perversion. Um, the fact that the Canaanites were worshiping the queen of heaven was considered an abomination. Um, but, you know, there's nothing new under the sun. I mean, I was shocked when, you know, I tuned into the women's broadcast um, for a general conference and to hear an apostle in women's conference tell modern Israel that they should not be worshiping the queen of heaven, you know, heavenly mother, was shocking to me that he would have to even say something like that. Our salvation is entirely dependent upon the Lord Jesus Christ. Um, and, you know, he is mighty to save and we are to pray to the Father in his name. Um, anything else is, you know, going after, you know, the mode and method of the Canaanites where you start introducing these, you know, strange doctrine to people with itching ears and then, they began having these groves and offering, you know, cakes to the, you know, Heavenly Mother and praying to her. And, you know, they turn, um, you know, Baal into, you know, uh, an abomination. Um, so that's what, you know, the Canaanites had become. And that's, that is, you know, what um, this woman was. But she... Everybody in the land of Canaan knew about this group of, you know, millions of Israelites that were wandering around in the desert. They knew what had happened in Egypt. Rahab even says as much to the scouts. Hey, we know all about you guys. And then they see the river Jordan divided and the waters piling up upon themselves in a heap. You know, Rahab says, listen, I know that the God of Israel is the God of, uh, you know, the whole earth. He's... He's it. There is no one besides him. I'm with you guys. I'm going to risk my life to save you, but I want you to save me and my family. 
And so these scouts covenant with her that she will be safe if she saves them so long as, you know, she does not, you know, tell the people about them. She keeps her word and they keep uh, their word. And Rahab is set up as a mother in Israel. In fact, if you look at the genealogy of Mary Magdalene, um, you'll see that Rahab is in her uh, family line. Um, so not only was she adopted into the house of Israel, but she became one of the mothers of Jesus Christ. So this, this goes, I mean, there's so much significance to this. I mean, just shows the character of the Lord about how he doesn't care about your genealogy. He cares about your heart. He cares about what you, what you will do. He doesn't care about where you have been. He cares about where you're going now. And Rahab had, you know, a really questionable past, but she, she dropped it all and she went full heartedly after the Lord and was an incredibly faithful woman after that time. And, you know, that's just how the Lord is. Um, he doesn't care about our past. I mean, essentially, when you take the worst human being and the best human being and you put them on a spectrum, I mean, you may see some distance, a significant distance between those two. But you then put the Lord on that same spectrum and we appear to be the same dot, the best of us and the worst of us, compared to what the Lord is. Um, the best of us and the worst of us are entirely dependent upon the Lord for our salvation. And if we will turn to him with full purpose of heart, then he will make of us a mighty people. Um, that's, you know, that's the story that I wanted to you know, make sure that you got from this. Um, so, so Jericho falls, right? Um, and it falls after the instructions of Jehovah to uh, Joshua outside the walls of Jericho. But then they go against the next city, um, i.e., I think, you know, Ai. Um, and Israel is rebuffed. And the reason that they're rebuffed is because, um, you know, the Lord tells Joshua, listen, I told you guys to destroy all the accursed things in Jericho. And yet, Achan took the accursed things and buried them in his house, in his tent, um, thinking that nobody would know, that he could bring, you know, these accursed things into his home and no one would be any the wiser. Now you look at our society today, it's filled with the chans, okay? People that are bringing and doing accursed things within the walls of their own home, thinking that nobody will be any the wiser. Um, but a chan is an example to all of Israel. Um, he was commanded to be brought before you know, the children of Israel where he confessed of his crime, what he did. He took, you know, basically a Sumerian garment that he found um, in Canaan. It's a Babylonish, but uh, you know, Babylon wasn't even really a thing at that time. It's really Babylon and, you know, Assyria there. They were all from the lands of Sumer. Uh, so it's really a Sumerian garment that he found. And the Canaanites had ties to, you know, the Sumerian culture and people. Um, <clears throat> And so he, he was destroyed. And if we want to survive the coming purge, because the people of the lands of Canaan were absolutely purged. They were wiped out, every man, woman, and child. And things like this have happened before, happened to the Jaredites, happened to the Nephites. Um, and Jesus Christ told the Nephites in the Book of Mormon, hey, this is going to happen again. And it's going to happen, you know, in the last days. Everyone that will not follow me will be wiped out, every man, woman, and child. Um, and specifically, he says that in the last days, a remnant of Jacob will return and that they will be amongst the Gentiles in North America, meaning the United States of America, as a lion and that it will tear them apart and the cities of the Gentiles will become desolate and that you know this remnant of Jacob will sow a destruction such as the Gentiles have never heard upon them. And, you know, that our cities will be without inhabitant. Um, now, 
in the Book of Mormon, the template for that kind of destruction was that the righteous were cast out of the cities uh, in advance. And I think that the same thing is going to happen today. That, you know, it's going to get to the point where, I mean, and it's not that big of a stretch, you know, when you, you see some of these, you know, Antifa and other just wild and crazy riots that have been taking places in some cities. Um, it is not a stretch of the imagination at all to see people rising up against people that hold Judeo-Christian values and driving them out. And once that happens, I mean, that's the sign that, I mean, we're, we're ripe and the remnant of Jacob will come and, and wipe out those cities because there are no righteous left, just like Sodom and Gomorrah. You know, they're all gone. And so the Lord, you know, wipes them out. That, this is the message, you know, of, you know, uh, Third Nephi, the predominant message. I mean, you read Third Nephi, you know, chapter 21, 22, 23. This is what it's talking about. This is what all the 19 Isaiah chapters talk about in the, um, in the Book of Mormon. So, you know, I just wanted to make sure that you understood this, these foundational doctrines, um, because what comes next is based upon what came uh, before us. And I mean, so many of, you know, these things are patterns. I mean, I could do a whole video, maybe I will, on, on just the exodus of Egypt and how all of those plagues, you know, correspond with the same um, events that take place once the seventh seal is opened and the seven angels sound their seven trumps. I mean, all of those, you know, tr the events are, you know, the same events that happened in Egypt uh, in order to get the people to repent and let um, Israel go. Uh, because in the last days, I mean, the prophecies, you know, clearly stay, state that there will be war uh, waged against, you know, the saints of God and that the saints of God will be overcome um, and that their liberation comes through a mighty hand. And, you know, that mighty hand, if you read in the Doctrine and Covenants, section 133, beginning with verse 26, it's the returning lost, uh, tribes of Israel who come from the north. And when they come, you know, there is no one that can stand against them. You know, the, the everlasting hills shake at their, uh, at their presence and the, en their enemies become a, uh, a prey to them. And they're led by their prophets. And, you know, a highway is cast up out of the midst of the great deep. I mean, the parallels between the future and the past are so clear. But if you don't understand them, then you, you don't understand what's coming. Um, this, is, this is foundational stuff for every, you know, every Christian to understand. And very few people do understand it. And very few people even have any interest to understand it because they think it sounds crazy. And it does sound crazy. Um, you know, but if you're not willing to do your own seeking, your own knocking, your own um, searching, then you can't expect the Lord to open these things up to you. But if you will, then he will open these things up to you, and it's amazing. You know, the, the whole reason that I'm willing to do this is just the hope that it will, you know, help you. Um, because at the end of the day, it's not, you know, it's not about material things. It's not about money. It's not about, you know, what the world thinks about us. It's about what the Lord thinks about us. And, you know, I think that, you know, you know, the Lord wants you to understand this. And if I can help you to understand this, to, to hunger and thirst for more knowledge than, you know, then I'm doing what the Lord wants me to do. So, um, and that's all that matters to me. And I hope that that's all that matters to you. So friends, um, I, I hope that this has been beneficial to you. Until next time, God bless.